Once upon a time. That's great, isn't it? Upon a time. And they don't even tell you what time that is yet. It's like, you have to find that out. I had written my first book because of Winn-Dixie, and my best friend's son I was eight years old at the time. Mom, he's so puny! He took me aside when I was visiting them and told me that he had the idea for a book um, that I should write about an unlikely hero with exceptionally large ears. Look at those ears! I said, that's a good idea. What happens to the hero? And he said, I don't know. That's why I want you to write the book. The spirit of Despero, this character who's in the way Kate described it is, he's so small, but he doesn't care. The world is bigger than he is, but he's willing to engage it and fight for what he thinks is right and not care what the odds or the obstacles are. Keep going, keep going. He has such an indomitable spirit that I think that's one of the things that's made the book so successful. The Newbery Award is the most prestigious children's literature award, and there's only one given out a year, and Kate won it. And uh, it's, it's really great recognition to receive for the book. This is a brand new classic fairy tale, right? Which may seem like a contradiction, but it really is. Kate chose to tell or invent a brand new fairy tale, but with a nod to what makes fairy tales kind of classic. She longed for a prince, a brave knight who would deliver her from all of this, someone with courage and honor and decency. We wanted the Tales of Despero to be, you know, character-driven, you know, a, a sort of a, for us to kind of be led by the emotional stories of each of the characters. And, and, and it's unusual because it is called the Tales of Despero and, it, and Despero is our hero. But of course, the other characters around him, Princess P, Roscuro and Migori Sao in particular, also have very involved and very interesting stories. And so we really needed to believe in these characters. Oh, my little mouse. These worlds are all connect because of the, of the people or the characters that live in, in them. It's you. I will deliver you from this evil, ma'am. We're so lucky in this in that we have a really, really wonderful cast. Dustin Hoffman, Emma Watson, Stanley Tucci, Kevin Klein, Sigourney Weaver, William H. Macy. There's so many great people. Tracy Ullman and Matthew Broderick. It's really pretty exciting. It's a very impressive cast. I'm very happy to be a part of it. Ah, it's so great to see you. I'm very lucky to play Princess P. And it's great because, you know, how many people get to play a princess? It's lovely. Oh, you're a smooth little mouse, aren't you? Bet you tell that to all the princesses. I am sworn to tell the truth. It is a code of honor. It's also just sort of fun to just, it's just something different, you know, to do a voice of a mouse. I don't know, it's fun. I like it. Yoo-hoo! Animation has always been done by putting people in an isolated booth and getting a clean track, like speaking into a microphone. I am sworn to tell the truth. But we have a performance-based piece, and we have some of the greatest actors in the world, and I wasn't gonna, I wasn't gonna turn them into just an ADR session. It's a code of honor. Gary's feeling was actors work better together and you're always gonna get a better performance, and let's let them loose. He always was trying to look, get a way to see what they would bring to a part. I am sworn to tell the truth. It's a code of honor. Ah, not just a gentleman, an honorable gentleman. Gary not only got us in the same room together, but he filmed it. You changed something. You're crazy. I did not touch it. I can smell it. Hmm? What's this? What? This! Aya! What is this? And because Gary wanted to have us really act it out fully, not only for us to discover, but for him to also see. And we tried it a variety of different ways and different degrees of insanity and intensity. Ow! No, stop! That's too much! That's not fair! We talked through the script and we uh, read the lines and we improvised the lines and Gary had props there and we used the props just to get the feel for, of things and I had never done an animated movie like that. Oh, oh no! Ah! Oh no! It's wonderful to record the actors together. You can kind of direct it more as a piece. You don't have to reassemble it later and attempt to kind of make it sound spontaneous. <laughs> You get your actors in the room and they bounce off each other. How could you put a full cup of coffee? <laughs> you idiot! I think it created a spontaneity to the performance and a life to this stuff. It's really, really important. And it may seem like, oh my God, why would you need Dustin Hoffman to 
convey complex emotion in a kid's movie. The truth is, the first impression when somebody sees me or sees one of my species, the first thing is, don't go in there. There's rats in there. But all the more reason, because kids know an emotional truth when they see it. I have come to apologize. We also did things a little differently than people do in other animation in terms of the way we shot the movie. Literally shot listed everything and gave that to the storyboard artist. And it saved us an amazing amount of time and money. Bellissima! Oh, for the stink! Oscuro! After the storyboard process, the film started to take shape, not only in the story, but also in the, in the design and the characters that were being built at Framestore. Why are you crying? <laughs> We had a great partner at Framestore. They've done an amazing job. The really great thing about animation is you can do anything you want with the camera. You could create it in live action, but it, w it would have been a different kind of, it would look different. As animators, we receive the sequence that has already been laid out as far as shots and as far as timing, and it has already a, a track that contains the selected clips of the voices. I am a gentleman. OK, I'm a rat. I am a rat. I am sorry. It's all about the misunderstanding and the complexity of the characters. No, no. <laughs> no! Please, <laughs> please, no! please listen. <laughs> please. A rat! Please. So it was sort of, if anything, closer to the live action. And we felt that the characters had to feel like real characters in order to be drawn to them, in order to feel what they were feeling. It's a classic knight's story, the kind we probably all have one as a kid that we just dove into and it transported us, you know? And we use some very different techniques in doing that. I mean, it literally looks like a storybook come to life. It's full CG, 3D animation, but you almost feel in the design as if the characters have lifted off the pages of a classic illustrated children's book and come to life in front of you. In certain scenes, Despero's running uh, through the crowd, you can forget that it's a computer. It's like building a little rough set with a little tiny camera and putting the little puppets in the set and moving the camera around and setting different tripods up and changing the lenses. Excuse me. Excuse me. Our objective is to create a different uh, feeling, more real, more immersive feel for the audience. This is an amazing ambition with this film to make it feel like a painting or like you're in a classic storybook. And so we're aiming for this, uh, a great richness of texture and atmosphere in this film. We really tried our best, given that this is a fairy tale, to kind of give it this timeless quality, to make something that looks quite old world. But a lot of the inspiration came from traditional medieval Dutch and Flemish painting. We early on decided that the castle would be a Vermeer kind of world, and that the mice were like Bruegel, lots of busy working people, and that the dungeon and rat world would be Hieronymus Bosch, and be weird and gross and silly, though. We're looking at their palettes, so the kind of colors they're using. We're not going for bright pinks and purples, that kind of thing. It's a very natural palette. A lot of the textures were actually hand-painted and then scanned into the computer and then applied to the various textures. So they literally are almost hand-painted. We hoped that it would be possible to do with light in CG what painting had done for centuries. We've kind of taken great pains to kind of light it naturally. Daylight coming in through windows, candles, torchlight, to light the characters, which I, I hadn't seen before. It's not just like a spotlight is pointing through the window. You have this wide source with all this light pouring in from lots of different directions. To combine the painterly influences with the quality of light that we're trying to get through, it's been very tricky technically, but then also creatively, just trying to merge all of those things together. Come with me. We're hoping to create the world where the audience would feel like they're participating and they can move into and they can take part in the action. I didn't want it to be just beautiful and visually entertaining, but also moving and emotionally engaging. I wanted the audience to be absorbed by the images on screen. 
There's a real ambition which you won't find in your average animated movie. Wow. You're gonna go on a journey in a place where nobody's ever been before. I'm ready. Kate wrote a classic fairy tale that was so successful that visually we were gonna get a chance to do something that we may not get it to do again because this movie asked for that. Come on, let's go! Shout! The Tale of Despero is an animated action adventure fairy tale. Oh. It's full of adventure and they're princesses and talking rats and mice. Oh my golly! In a castle in a faraway land. And the great thing about it is it puts the book into the hands of people who might not ever pick up the book. And that's a grand thing. Yahoo!